Hello, my name is Jeffrey Franck. I am a clinical professor of emergency medicine at the University of Alberta and a visiting professor of disaster medicine at UPO in Novara, Italy. And I am the CEO of MedStat Studio. Today we will be going through a crash course in incident command system and it's all about what is the least I need to know. So objectives for this session are to understand the basic principles of ICS, Incident Command System Management, to describe how the hospital incident command system has been adapted for hospital use, and to demonstrate the ability to set up an ICS-based command structure using a simplified emergency department system. So uh, many of you probably have seen this diagram it shows up in disaster plans all around the world and most of us can look at it uh, and assume right at the outset that it's too complicated that we can never understand it and we would never want to use it in a disaster situation and I would be in a hundred percent agreement with it the way this is presented none of us would want to try to figure out how to use this during a disaster okay. why is this well I want to talk a little bit about what ICS is. So Incident Command System is a model for command structure and for coordination of emergency response. It can be used for events of any size or type, but it is not a simple structure. It's designed to manage chaos. It's designed to manage chaotic disaster events and as such it is just simply a difficult structure. Okay. This is my five second summary. This is what you really need to know. The big parts of ICS that all of us should store in our head. Okay, so the first qualified person on the scene is the incident commander. And at the outset, the incident commander is initially responsible for all duties. The incident commander recruits staff as needed. And then the incident commander adds positions, which are middle managers, basically to the org structure only when needed. Okay, That's really important. Only when we need to add middle managers do we add them. Okay, And the initial incident commander is responsible until authority is delegated to another person. Okay, One of my favorite analogies that I like to use is this is basically the same as if you were opening up an ice cream store I'm a big ice cream aficionado and if I could I would like to give my life away and open up an ice cream store. If you open up an ice cream store, how does it work? Well, the first qualified person on the scene is the instant commander. When I walk into my new store, I am the instant commander. And I'm initially responsible for all the duties. So when I first open my my ice cream store, I will be responsible for making the ice cream, serving the ice cream, cleaning the store, purchasing, paying the bills, all of those things. And then generally when you start one of these, you recruit staff as needed. So eventually I might need salespeople. I might need a uh, person who does, does maintenance. And then we add these positions, middle managers, to the org structure only when needed. Okay, So the first day that I open up my ice cream store, I probably don't need a VP finance. right? I probably don't need that position. When I need it, I will add it. And I will be responsible for everything at the ice cream store until I delegate that authority to someone else. Okay, so that's basically the, the entire gist of ICS is exactly like you open up an ice cream store. ICS is based on these 12 principles. Uh, for anyone who is taking the official ICS courses, you'll go through these basically one at a time. And I highly recommend the courses. They are fantastic, but they're very time consuming. The level 200, 300 courses take you know, two days each. Most of us don't really have time to devote that to that. But these are the 12 principles. They all make sense. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a few of them that are most important for us in disaster management. Okay, So I'm going to talk about the five primary management functions, how to establish and transfer command, the use of single or unified command, and then we're going to define what is unity in chain of command, 
what exactly is manageable span of control, and what does this mean modular organization. Okay, so those are the basics that we're going to go through today that to help you get oriented into ICS. What are the five primary management functions? Most of us, when we think of ICS, these are the things that come to our mind. Most of us have seen one of these diagrams. This is the appropriate colors for these five primary management functions. Green is for command, blue is for planning, orange is for operations, yellow is for logistics, and gray is for finance admin. Okay? So these are the five primary pieces of this puzzle that makes into an ICS organization structure. Command is the only mandatory position. Okay? So every incident being followed being managed by incident command system must have an incident commander and it is the only mandatory position. Incident commander accepts and maintains overall responsibility at the incident and the incident command post is where the IC manages on scene command functions. Okay, So if I was walking into my ice cream store first day I'm the incident commander I have overall responsibility at the ice cream store and I will walk into my office and say this is the incident command post. Okay? And that's all you need to form an ICS structure. So you will see people say, you know, we didn't need an ICS structure, the incident was too small. You can make this IC structure starting from a single person who's the incident commander. Now, uh, the command staff, which are there in the org structure, in general, in ICS, there's three possible positions. This is your liaison officer, safety officer, and information officer. These are assistants to the incident commander. They directly are responsible to the IC. Okay? And these are added when the IC is unable to fill these duties. And you can sort of imagine what these are. Liaison officer is communication with other institutions, with other organizational structures. Safety officer is looking to make sure everyone's safe, and the information officer is responsible for amalgamation of all the information coming into the organizational structure and for the exit and proper um, description of the outgoing information. And again, these are added only when the instant commander is unable to fill their duties, and only one staff usually for each of these positions, but they have assistance. Okay, so those are your command staff. You will see them on the organizational structure in red. So now the general staff, so in small incidents your incident commander is going to supervise resources directly. Okay, so when I open my ice cream store, maybe one week into selling ice cream, I have a uh, maybe let's say I have five people who are serving ice cream. Well, I will, as the incident commander, supervise them directly. Okay, So in the medical system, that might mean I am on a scene where there's a number of ambulances. There's five ambulances. I say I'm the incident commander, and I am going to supervise these incidents, these uh, resources, which are the ambulances, directly. But you can imagine that as this incident grows, this becomes very difficult. Okay? Um, and that is when we will divide the org structure up by adding these sort of vice president type roles, which is the operations section chief, the planning section chief, the logistics section chief, and the finance section chief. So uh, the operations section, which is your big part in orange in the org structure, that's responsible for carrying out all the tactical operations. Okay, so if you consider disaster management from the point of view of paramedics, nurses, physicians, the operations section is basically care of the patients. Okay, so anyone who's caring for patients, caring for victims of the disaster, will be uh, part of the operations section. That's what we mean by tactical operations. And so again, initially, when I own my ice cream store, I will be supervising all the operations. Okay? But as you can imagine, if the ice cream store becomes the size of, I'm going to use Ben and Jerry's, a big uh, US uh, ice cream conglomerate that has thousands of stores, obviously, you don't supervise those people directly. You 
designate an operations section chief. And they are responsible for directing and coordinating all the tactical operations, setting up and maintaining the organizational structure, determining the resources needed. There, you're going to request those resources through the incident commander and keep the incident commander informed of the resource status. Okay? So again, operations section chief is there if the incident commander is overwhelmed and needs assistance in the operations area. Planning in smaller incidents, and in fact most of the incidents that I've been involved in, command is responsible for the planning. Okay, as the incident grows, a planning section can be added, and this contains these five units, resources units, situation units, documentation unit, demobilization unit, technical specialists. This is generally for incidents that are lasting many days and involving probably at this point you're going to have at least hundreds of people in the organizational structure before you're going to dig down this deep. Okay. The important thing to know is ICS provides provisions for a planning section if you need it, but again in most cases we won't need a planning section. The incident command is going to be responsible for planning. Logistics is responsible for all the service and support needs of the incident and to just inject some ICS uh, vocabulary in here. Just to remember we talked about an incident command post as being the site of where the incident commander is on scene. Incident command also allows for the, uh, the installation of a base and a camp and if those are used those are managed by the logistics section. And again the logistics section is determined by the incident commander do you need that? And it can be divided into two branches, which are the service branch and the support branch. Okay. So again, logistics is there. Logistics provides support. Okay. So in the case of, again, talking about medical disasters in paramedics, physicians, nurses, if you're part of logistics, you are not directly caring for the patients. You are providing support for the other members of the org structure who are providing care for the patients. And then finally the finance and min section and this is for large in incidents where we require off-site management of finance and admin and there we have four units the time unit, procurement unit, compensation claims unit and the cost unit. Okay? And again this is probably something that most of us if we're working in the healthcare field we probably won't necessarily need to be involved directly in this. We should know it exists. We should know that as an incident commander if you're running into problems here you should start this section. Okay so that's really the five uh, parts of the structure, the org structure. Everyone will be one in one of those five parts. To go on to the second topic here is establishment and transfer of command. So just remember the first trained person on the scene is the incident commander or the first qualified responder on scene is the incident commander. Okay? We transfer command when more qualified individual is available, there's a long operational period, or some other agency has jurisdictional or legal authority. I want to take a, a moment to discuss what exactly more qualified individual is available. In the ICS parlance, we don't talk about rank within the organization. In particular, we don't say, okay, by definition, the fire chief, because they are the chief of, of fire, they are the incident commander. Okay? What we look for is who is best to be the incident commander, and the transfer of command is goes in that direction. Okay, So who is most qualified? Not who is most senior, not who is, has the highest rank, but who is most qualified. Remembering of course that in some cases you may be stuck in that other agencies have jurisdictional or legal authority. We need to follow that, but in general the push is to find the most qualified individual. Now when we talk about command we often talk about the incident commander as a single person, but it's important to note that that's not mandatory part of ICS. In fact, the incident command can be a unified group of several people. 
Often this works when uh, a group of agencies are coming together to share the incident management and the agencies work together determining the overall objectives, planning for operational activities, and maximizing the use of all assigned resources. So for instance, in an emergency department situation, we might say the command involves the charge nurse and the charge physician. They are unified command. They work together. Or at a scene, you might say that fire, police, and ambulance, the three of those will form a unified command. Okay. Unity and chain of command is an important part of ICS that my personal experience has been when I work with groups that include nurses, paramedics, or military. This is all common sense. You know, nurses and paramedics, military, they're used to working in this situation where each person has a supervisor and there's an orderly line of progression from the incident commander all the way down to each resource. Okay. Physicians, on the other hand, this is not usually part of our daily work. Okay. Most of us as physicians are sort of out there as independent units. We don't really feel like we have a boss and a boss that has a boss's boss. Uh, so this can be really tricky for us as physicians. Any of you are physicians like I am in this situation. Remember that we report to only one supervisor. Okay, so that's really important. Most of us as physicians will want to go straight to the top of the command chain. If I have questions, I want to speak directly to the incident commander. Well, the whole purpose of the organizational structure is to, to control against the fact that the incident commander does not have time or cognitive load to hear from every person in the org structure directly. So we go up to the person who's our supervisor. And when the incident commander has something that needs to be done, normally the incident commander will move one step down the chain. So if I'm the incident commander and I have a big organizational structure and I need uh, additional supplies, let's say I need additional ventilators in the emergency department, I would go not to the respiratory therapists and porters and equipment managers, but I would go to the logistics section leader and I would say, excuse me, logistics section leader, I need more ventilators. It is now up to the logistics section chief to find those ventilators. Span of control is really the, uh, this is the impetus for how we develop the org structure, why we develop the org structure. So I talked about the fact that we would like to all talk to the instant commander. We know, however, that none of us can supervise a hundred people. Okay? We cannot directly supervise a hundred people. How many people can you supervise? Well, you know, in our normal day-to-day -day life, if we knew our jobs well, you know, many of us might be able to survive, supervise 20, 30 people. But remember that in ICS, pretty much by definition, all of us are going to be doing jobs that we don't normally do. Okay? And thus, ICS says that each person can supervise between three and seven. Now we're sometimes pushing it to 10, but usually between three and seven people. The ideal range being one in five. Okay? So we should aim to supervise between uh, three and, and seven people. And that's the purpose of the structure. Okay, so now if it's too large, okay, I open up my uh, my ice cream store, and the first day I have uh, five people making ice cream, and I have five people selling ice cream, and I have five people taking care of the uh, logistics. Well, I can't supervise those people as the owner of the ice cream store, so I'm going to add middle management positions, which are vice presidents, or in ICS, they are your section chiefs usually. And the organization expands. And then, of course, if it's too small, the organization contracts. Okay, So if you see a person supervising one other person, that obviously doesn't make sense. It's poor use of structure. Okay, So if you, for instance, have two people in the emergency department who are providing patient care and you designate an 
operations section chief to supervise them, well, that's very poor use of your uh, resources, right? We, we don't need an operations section chief to supervise two people. In fact, we would take the operations section chief and put them into a direct care role. We'd say, you also are going to provide patient care. Now the three of you are providing patient care and the incident commander would supervise. Okay, So watch for those when you're building up this structure, when you're drawing it out. Watch for those times when you see too many people below a management. Okay, The span of control of 1 to 20. Or it's too small. You see the span of control of one person supervising another. This is the big advantage of ICS. Okay, the, It can be used to manage instance of any size. It's also one of the more complicated problems with ICS because basically by definition you cannot draw ahead of time your exact org structure okay? because you don't know where you're going to need people. You don't know who's going to be there in advance. It's a disaster. So it has to be flexible. You can't draw down in advance. You have to watch for the span of control. And then, last, I want to talk about modular organization. Just remember that 95% of incidents are managed by the IC alone. Okay? When I first start my, my small business of ice cream, instant commander supervising everybody. And we add those positions in the org chart only when needed. One of the things I often see when we run drills, I've been fortunate to do well over a hundred uh, different drills using computer software where we get teams together to manage an emergency department by instant command system. One of the big things I see is often the first thing they do is they say, here's our org chart, you're the logistics chief, you're the operations section chief, you're finance admin, and you are planning when they only have eight people and they don't need someone to do planning or finance admin. Okay, don't add those those positions unless you need them. Okay, so that's um, basically a good summary of instant command system. And what I want to do now is sort of keep it to drive it home by creating a really a practical example how you manage an ICS structure. Okay, so here's the scenario. You're working at the Geyserville Hospital. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and you are notified of a pending disaster. We're going to use for this scenario, we're going to say that we, uh, you're one of the physicians working at the Geyserville Hospital. There's you and two other staff members who are physicians. And the hospital has this existing disaster plan based on ICS. What I'm going to use today is an abbreviated form of ICS that we use for for our training exercises, which is called ICED, Incident Command for Emergency Department. So how do you organize your structure? So there you are, there's you and two other staff members. Okay. Um, this is uh, any ICS-based hospital disaster plan should have an organizational chart in the disaster plan document. Okay. So here is the ICED command organization chart. You see what it shows is in the emergency department we have a charge physician, uh, physician liaison, and then we have red, yellow, green unit, triage unit, pediatric unit. Okay, So that's our organizational chart. You'll see we've chosen to call the charge physician the charge physician rather than the incident commander. Um, you function as the incident commander, but in this situation we just prefer to try to keep day-to-day -day activities as much as possible. Okay, so here we go. So someone has to be the incident commander. That's the only mandatory position in the structure. So I'm there at 3 o'clock at the Geyserville Hospital. I say, okay, I'm going to be the incident commander and I'm going to ask one of you to go into the red unit. You're the leader of the red unit. And one of you I'm going to send to the pediatrics unit. You're the pediatric unit leader. And there's our org structure. Okay, So there we have the incident commander supervising two people. All right, now you are the newly appointed incident commander. So what's the first thing to do? 
Now, all of you should have through your mind a number of things. Okay, I'm going to need to confirm the incident. I'm going to need to talk with my team. I'm probably going to need to start some documentation. I'm going to have to decide who in the hospital I need to notify. Okay, most likely you will have never done this before, or it will be something that you've done very rarely. Okay, most of us are not instant commander every day. So, what should you do? To me, the most important part of the disaster plan is this, the, uh, the job action sheets. Okay? So here, what I would ask all people who I have work in my department, work in the department with me, if I make their disaster plan, I say, here's your number one thing. If there's a disaster, go to the binder and grab your job action sheet. Pull this sheet out, carry it around, start at the top and start doing the things on it. Okay, So here it says verify the information, declare a major incident, read the job action sheet, put on your identification tag. Here you're going to meet with your dyad partner who's the charge nurse, establish the emergency department instant command post. Okay, So this is what you should do. I personally um, believe that the thinner your disaster plan the better. The, the, we try to strip these disaster plans down to the minimal amount to keep people going. And I believe these job action sheets represent an excellent way to do that. Each person will have only one job action sheet. They pull it, that piece of paper out of the disaster plan, read it, and go on with that. I do not believe that we should try to train everyone in our hospital what to do in the event of a disaster, what they should do if they happen to be the instant commander. Okay. Just tell them, grab their job action sheet. One of the things that um, things tend to move very quickly at the beginning of a disaster. We try to, we sort of push them to move very quickly. And one of the things that we often don't do is document what's going on. Okay. What's going to happen very quickly is that your, uh, in this case, in, we're working in an emergency department, your emergency department is going to be overrun with people you're going to be developing an organizational system and if you don't document it is going to be very difficult for other people to work in the system. Okay, So you start, a bunch of people come in, you send them to the red, yellow, green area, then you have someone come in and you say, you know, I need you to be the operations chief and they say, okay, who am I supervising? Well, you don't want to have to go back in your head and try to remember that. You're going to need to have written it down. Okay, so I would start documentation immediately, right from the point where you draw the instant commander's name in. How do you do this? Well, in our when we do our simulations, we use this very simplified instant command organization chart. Okay, you just write the names as they come in. Uh, now, hospital instant command system, which is uh, basically you can download this off the internet. It's uh, a, almost a pre-made implementation of Incident Command for use in the hospital. Okay, So you can download the whole package off the internet and there you have Form 207 which is the organizational chart. I personally like it but it is a bit tricky to use. In particular it can be tricky because the organizational chart is quite rigid and it doesn't include the resources. Okay, So this is your organizational structure but it doesn't tell you who is actually caring for the patients. Okay, uh, But one of those. Alright, now within 15 minutes you have two more physicians. So how will you organize the structure? So if you remember we started with the instant commander and two uh, we decided on a red unit leader and a pediatrics unit leader. Okay, So right now I might say okay you are the leaders of these red unit leader, yellow unit leader, triage unit, pediatrics unit. All of you go to your unit. Remembering that until the red unit leader has someone working underneath them they're responsible for everything, which means initially they're actually responsible for patient care. Okay, Go in there, do your thing. Now, as the staff arrives, you need to keep track of who is working and where. This is really tricky. I like to have some sort of check-in sheet. So here, 
again we use this ICED instant check-in it just says your name what agency you're from where we assigned you to how to contact you time you come in and we ask people to sign out when they come out that way we can very quickly get a brief look of who is still in the department who's out of the department uh, now incident command system also has its own set of forms and again you can download these off the internet and use them in your own agency or use them as a start to develop your own custom forms this is the check-in list for ICS it, um, it I think it's a very good form it is more oriented really to on scene management you'll see it has things such as where's your home base departure point method of travel okay so this is another form very useful I think mostly more useful for on scene management but again you can get these and adapt them to your own system all right so now you are the red unit leader we've had a whole bunch of people come in and we say the instant commander has given you more staff Okay, so the instant commander has found four physicians, two senior residents, three medical students, and six nurses, and said, go, you are now supervised by the red unit leader. Okay, and you see for the incident commander, the incident commander will no longer supervise directly these people. They're going to send them to the red unit leader. Now, how can the structure be reorganized? Okay, so this is exactly what most of us will try to do without the use of instant command. Okay? Most of us will try to work harder and faster at what we usually do. So the incident commander's initial instincts is usually to supervise everyone directly. And you get this mess. Okay? So you get the incident commander supervising everyone. And so you see that we have a span of control here of, I think it's 1 to 12. About 1 to 12, 1 to 13. Okay? This is what you should not do. Okay, none of us should try to supervise the red unit leader and two medical students and the uh, red unit medical doctors. Okay, we cannot do this. We don't do it. Instead, we're going to have to reorganize them. Here, uh, something that I kind of like to do is just step back and say, okay, imagine that ICS didn't exist. You know, practically, what would you do? Well, Practically, you would probably assemble these resources into some sort of small groups. Okay, so each resource can be managed as a single resource. Okay, so I am the incident commander and I am supervising a single physician. The resources can be managed as a strike team. Okay, and just to clarify in ICS vocabulary, strike team has a specific connotation, it is a group of equal resources. Okay? So if I was supervising, for instance, five respiratory therapists, okay, that is a strike team of respiratory therapists. And the other way resources can be managed is you can organize them into task force, which is a group of, of diverse uh, resources organized to perform a specific task. Okay, so a team, I think of a team of soccer players and a task force is a group got put together to, for, to do a task. So a task force might be a physician uh, with a respiratory therapist, a nurse, a paramedic, a medical student. They form one task force. So practically most of us would probably do this. You know, if I was the red unit leader and the incident commander said, here are your resources, I would say, okay, here I have four physicians. I'm going to distribute the residents the best I can equally, distribute the nurses, distribute the medical students into these four task forces. Now as the red unit leader, I will communicate only with the leader of the task force. Okay? So I'm going to ask each task force to designate a leader. Maybe it's the, the nurse from each task force. And I will now only communicate with the nurse from that task force. Okay. So thus, if I was the doctor working in task force number one and I need more chest tubes, I would talk to my task force unit, task force leader, which in this case we've said is the nurse. He or she would then go to the red unit leader and the red unit leader would resp be responsible for getting those chest tubes for me. Okay. So just to make that clear, each task force has a leader and only the leader 
communicates up to the next step in the org structure. And so you can see here the red unit leader now is really only supervising four task forces. Okay. And again, just to reiterate, um, as the organization becomes more complicated, you can see how documentation is needed. So now you're the incident commander, and someone comes in, let's say, for instance, you're the incident commander, and someone who is more qualified than you comes in and says, you know, I think I should take over as instant commander. And you say, yep, you definitely should. And the new instant commander says, I want to see who's working where. Okay, There is no way in your head you would be able to have stored who's working in all these task forces. It has to be written down. In the ICED system, we have just a simple task force assignment list. It says, which unit are you? And it numbers your task forces, and you just write in the people there. Okay. And thus, the, uh, everyone in the organization can quickly see who is in each one of these task forces. The HICS uh, organizational assignment list, which is Form 203, uh, this list is organizational positions as they're added. I actually, the form works very well if you understand the ICS structure very well, because you have to sort of have it in your head where each of these pieces fits in. Uh, it tends to be better, I believe, at a high level. So if you are working at, in the instant command post, this is probably helpful to you. At the lower down levels at the resources, it's a bit difficult to follow. And then, you know, this works very well. Um, this is from one of our um, drills that we did where the incident commander, she just drew out the organization and the resources as she, as she added, and this worked very well. She was able to very quickly, if you asked her who's doing what in the organization, she could look at her freehand diagram. Okay, and again, to iterate, what does the red unit leader know what to do? Okay, so now I'm just going to throw out, for instance, that the red unit leader happens to be in this case we've designated a physician as the red unit leader. And for those of us who are physicians, this is probably a position we have not done before. You know, most of us are not going to be in the position where our previous job was, was supervising four task forces. Okay? If you're nursing or paramedic or military, this might be closer to home for you. But for physicians, this is a completely foreign territory for most of us. So just remember, again, job action sheet. The instant commander says, you are the red unit physician leader, you grab your sheet, you tear it out of the binder, follow it, okay? Because you're not expected to remember all of these duties. Now, triage is becoming overwhelmed in our disaster here in Geyserville, and they're requesting three more workers to perform triage. And again, how could you organize the structure? So here, this is what it looks like so far. We have the incident commander, the red unit has these four task forces, the yellow unit, and we've sent someone out to triage, and now we're going to add three extra resources for them to do triage, okay? So normally what would happen in this case is whoever is out at triage, who already knows the triage area would serve as the leader, supervising these three resources. Okay, now let's just take a quick look here at our span of control and you will see that this looks good, right? The instant commander is supervising four people. The red unit leader is supervising four task forces. Okay, so that's a span of control of one to four. Triage unit has the same expansion for one to three. Okay, and we just make the same expansion for the emergent treatment unit, the urgent treatment unit, or the red, green, yellow, however you call it in your hospital. And again, don't forget those job action sheets. If you are the responsible for doing the disaster planning in your hospital or your institution, I personally don't believe that we should try to drill into people to memorize what to do when they're the incident commander or the red unit leader drill into them to pick up their job action sheets. Okay, now you can see how this disaster is scaling very quickly and now the instant commander has having difficulty with the multitude of external agencies. So all of a sudden as the incident commander there's the media, 
the regional deployment, the EMS supervisor, the mayor, the premier, they all want to know what's going on. Okay, And here is where these command staff positions come in. So one is you could add a deputy incident commander. Um, I, yeah, I, that can work and that's a, a certainly a legal part of the incident command structure. Or you add a liaison officer and in the ICED system we add this uh, liaison officer who's basically then responsible for communications from the incident commander out to the, uh, the rest of the structure. Yeah. One of the things to remember, if you take a look at the liaison officer, liaison officer does, you do not supervise the liaison officer as the incident commander. So you see the way it, the line to the liaison officer is off to the side. Okay, so here in this diagram, the incident commander's span of control is actually one to four. You're supervising four people. Okay. You're working at the IC, the director of the department, your boss arrives. What are the options for command? Okay. So what does ICS say about what you should do about the command structure? Well, one possibility is the present command remains. Okay. So we talked about who is more qualified. Okay. So, you know, I work uh, a lot with students from the the European Master in Disaster Medicine. Most when they graduate from their program, they're the experts in the in the uh, field of disaster medicine. Almost certainly if one of these students who graduate from the EMDM are supervising as incident commander, when their boss comes, their boss, if they're not from the EMDM, will probably say, please go on, okay? Technically, I'm your boss, but you are more qualified to do this job, so you should keep going. We can hand over command, and sometimes what will happen is as the, um, the 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 organizational structure is expanding, you will move the unit leader in move on to the unit leader. So the incident command, present incident command will move down to the operations chief and the new incident commander comes in. Or move to another position. You might say, you know, thank you for being the incident commander. Appreciate all the work you've done, but we really need help in the ambulatory section, in the green unit. So please go to the green unit, report to the green unit leader and, and see what you can do to help. Or they can, of course, enter joint command, right? We talked about that, that uh, ICS can have either uh, single or joint command. And again, just you can see how this is becoming complicated. Recording the organization is very important. When the my boss comes in in this scenario and says, okay, I'm taking over as incident commander, I need to be able to give a very quick, succinct summary of what's going on. And if you have not recorded this, that's going to be difficult. Now, um, again, for most disasters that are not prolonged, only the operation, operation section and the command positions are likely to be needed. We're not likely to add logistics, administration, or planning, but they're there. If we need to, we add them in in the same way. Okay. So that sort of sums up uh, the instant command structure as we have it now. Uh, and again, this is how the ICED system works, right? So this, there's the org structure for this particular implementation of ICED that we use for emergency departments. There's a logistics unit, planet unit, finance admin unit. Um, and then to just talk a little bit about communications, just remember that um, command flows usually one step down. Okay, so the as the incident commander, I don't give command to the resources directly. They go down the chain of command in the org structure and request for resources go one step up. Okay, So if I'm working in the task force, the red unit task, uh, task force, I ask the task force leader for resources. The task force leader asks the red unit leader. Okay, They don't go up all the way. The ICS uh, mandate is that information can flow in any direction. Okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about this information flow. One of the major issues with uh, disaster in the drills that I've been involved with and in the real disasters that I've been involved with is communications. Most specifically in the debriefing there is usually a comment about a lack of communication. Okay. Uh, if you 
dig down deep, my impression of this is that many times what we call a communications problem is actually a coordination problem. In particular, my observation has been that it's often too, the quantity of information is actually too much, but the problem is the right pieces of information are not going to the right people. Okay, So this is from uh, Emergency Operations Center. Okay, so just to allude briefly to EOC, EOC is a step above ICS and it is usually implemented when there is a region-wide need for supervision. Okay, so if you look at this diagram, you'll see uh, to the far left, we see incident commander site level. Okay, so that's the incident commander that we just talked about the Geyserville Hospital Charge Physician Incident Commander, and that ICS structure actually would come out of this. Okay, But sometimes there's a need to coordinate a bunch of incident commanders. Okay, So if you imagine the situation where you have a city, there's an accident at an airport, and the all the hospitals in the city are going to be overwhelmed. There's an incident commander at each site who helps to communicate between sites. So one way would be to the ICS mantra, communication information can go anywhere, which would involve, you know, if the charge nurse at our hospital had questions about what was going on at the other hospital, he or she could call the charge nurse at the other hospital. And if the charge physician had questions, he or she could call the charge nurse at the other physicians at the other hospital. I personally find that form of communication results in a high quantity of communication but a low quality. Instead, EOC would state we should invoke this emergency operations center and then communications from each incident goes through the emergency operations center. Okay? So EOC is the topic of a complete other lecture. But just remember that there's the possibility to coordinate between the incident commanders in a region using Emergency Operations Center. And I believe that works much better than allowing communication to flow between sites with no structure. Okay. Now, another part where communication can really break down is communications with other agencies. Okay, And so you will see here, this is from the HICS uh, package, and you'll see incident commander in the center. Okay, And what you see that is um, many other places, so you have local hospitals, uh, community public safety, local EOC, and what you see is that the incident commander in this structure does not communicate directly, for instance, with other hospitals. Okay, I personally don't believe that as the incident commander you should necessarily be talking to other hospitals. Instead, there is the hospital command center, and maybe there's an agency executive or hospital public information officer, liaison officer, the incident commander communicates with these people and they then can coordinate with the other hospitals. Okay, So one of the things that I see often occur in communications with other agencies is that everybody wants to talk to the incident commander and it just doesn't work. Very quickly the incident commander is overloaded with information. Okay. Um, my just to give my personal recollection on what, uh, like I said, you know, being involved with hundreds of drills and with several uh, rear, real emergency disaster situations, is what tends to work best is if information at the site level flows for up the chain of command. Okay, information flows up the chain of command. Command flows down the chain of command. If there are multiple sites within the responding area, an EOC is used to coordinate them and communication between sites goes through the EOC. And that the incident commander does not communicate directly with other agencies, but through the liaison officer or through the, the hospital uh, emergency operations center. 
So that sort of sums up ICS again. We're looking at what's the least you should know. So you really should understand the basic principles of ICS. Uh, should understand how the HICS system has been born from ICS, but has been adapted for hospital use. And you should demonstrate the ability to set up an ICS-based command structure using a simplified emergency department system. Thank you very much. Once again, I'm Jeffrey Franck, and uh, that was our crash course in ICS. What's the least you need to know?